a warm welcome to this talk. It's Monday the 9th of August. Now I want to start off with um, a report about fertility in men after the vaccine and then we'll finish off with some parts of other parts of the world and a report from Canada. Now let's start off with the news about the effects on sperm count after COVID-19 vaccination. And if you haven't got time to watch the video, the study I'm going to report on from the uh, JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, is saying that vaccination does not have an adverse effect on sperm count. So this is basically a good news report. But let's look at the details. It is quite interesting. So sperm parameters before and after COVID-19 mRNA vaccination. Now, this is for the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. In the States, this study was actually done in Miami University. So you could argue that it is specific. Well, it is specific to that area and these particular types of vaccines. We can only speak to where the information is. And of course, this tells us nothing about female fertility. Not that we have any reason to suspect that that will be compromised by vaccination at all. But let's stick with what we know. Reproductive toxicity was not evaluated in the clinical trials. Now, this has given rise to quite a bit of concern Worse, it has to be said, in some areas of the world compared to others. For example, Pakistan, areas of Africa have been quite concerned about this. And this can put their minds essentially to rest in terms of male sperm production from this study. Um, SARS coronavirus 2 has been associated with decrease in sperm parameters. Now, what this is saying is that the infection itself, which of course the vaccine is protecting against, may well have an effect on fertility. No date, no data on that in this study or much data on that yet. So we're not going to comment on that. But there is suspicion that COVID-19 can reduce fertility in some individuals. So this study, we assess sperm parameters before and after the vaccine. Volunteers aged uh, 18 to 50 years, as we said, associated with Miami University. Numbers pretty small, 45, but we'll see the data is significant. So they were scheduled for the mRNA COVID-19 vaccine. And so they were scheduled for it. And then before they had the vaccine, participants provided a semen sample after two to seven days of abstinence. That is uh, not uh, ejaculating in that two to seven days prior to receiving the first vaccine dose. Then they received the first vaccine dose, then the second dose. And then it was a median time of 75 days after the second dose that they took the results. So that's going to be another what? Another 21 28 days after the first dose. So 75 days medium after the second dose that these results apply to. Um, semen analysis, uh, semen volume, sperm concentration, sperm motility uh, and uh, total sperm count was total motile sperm count were all fine. But let's look at the results in a bit more detail. So this is done from the 17th of December 2020 to January 2021. Fine. Of the 45 men, roughly half receiving Pfizer and roughly half receiving Moderna. So that does seem to sort of cover both vaccines. Now, baseline, this is before they had the first injection. Medium sperm concentration, 26 million sperm per mil was the median sperm concentration. But what really counts with um, fertility really is how many sperm are motile because they got to swim towards the ovum. So um, that's the key parameter. And the total sperm count there was uh, total motile sper sperm count was 36 million. Roughly, you can have fertility problems if it drops below 20 million is a, is a rough uh, estimate. Um, it total sperm count. Uh, after the second dose of the vaccine, what happened? Well, the medium sperm concentrations were, went up to 39. So remember, they were 26. They went up to 39. And total motile sperm count went up from 36 million motile sperms up to 44 million motile sperms. So we see on both parameters there, the, um, the fertility improved. And we're going to look at why that is in a minute, just have to stick around. Now, uh, serum volume and sperm motility also significantly increased. So the overall volume of seminal fluid was increased. Typically, you're talking about going up to four, five, six mils volume there. Eight of the 45 men were oligospermic before the vaccine. Oligo means they weren't infertile, but oligo means not enough. But of these, after the 75 days after the vaccine, of these eight men, seven had increased sperm concentrations and became normospermic. 
So they're producing normal concentrations of sperm. Um, men with oligospermia did not experience a further decline. No man experienced a further decline and no man became aspermic, aspermic after the vaccine. Um, so in other words, no one had no sperm. So the full parameters are here. Uh, the link's the paper there. But but um, so let me get rid of me. Um, quite interesting, really. So it's looking at the vo total volume of seminal fluid, the sperm concentration, the percentage of sperm that were motile and the total sperm concentration, um, for, for, which is perhaps one of the key number, the total sperm concentration. So and, and basically we see that um, the, these are the normal values here and we see that they all increase. So the volume went up from 2.2 .2 to 2.7. The concentration went up from 26 to 30 million sperm per mil. The percentage of motile sperm went up from 58 to 65. And the, uh, the, the total sperm uh, concentration went up from 36 to 44. All significant results. Now, we are not saying, and the authors were not saying, <laughs> that vaccine is increasing sperm count. There's other factors. Let's look at those briefly. Uh, let's just look at the, uh, let's just look at that. That's quite a useful graphic there. Each bar here represents one man. So um, this one was quite a lot more. This one was less more. These ones had slightly less. So we see the mean, the mean, the median there is, is up there somewhere. So the, the average was an increase. And that's the total change in uh, motile sperm. Uh, TMSC, total mo motile sperm uh, concentration. Um, so a few, a few were lower, most were higher. So um, in interesting. Discussion. No specific decrease in any sperm parameter among small cohorts of healthy men. So that, that, that's basically established. And of course, these these changes. So e each bar here is the change in one man between the before and after, if you like. And none of these are actually really significant in statistical terms. Th these ones here, they said, are nothing to worry about. And these ones here are probably due to uh, procedural artefacts rather than the vaccine as we said, it would be surprising. <laughs> There'd be no possible mechanism really for why the vaccine would increase sperm count. Vaccines containing messenger RNA do um, not the live virus. They, they say they're unlikely that the vaccine would affect sperm parameters. So it's unlikely anyway that in terms of scientific rationale, there's no reason why this should be a problem. And yet it's been such a widespread issue around the world, which is why I'm drawing attention to it. Um, now, reason for the increases in sperm after vaccine, a magnitude of, of changes within the normal individual variation. So that's not too surprising. May be influenced by regression to the mean. So, so what this is saying is the counts before were maybe a little bit low and they become closer to the average um, as a re result of collecting second specimens. May, may, maybe the first time the men gave the specimens, it was affecting their physiology to some degree. Uh, increasing abstinence time before the second sample may have been a factor. Uh, study time frame encompasses the full life cycle of the sperm. So in other words, um, these sperm that were analysed 75 days after the second dose of vaccine had been produced after the second dose of the vaccine had been given. It was in the... Um, it, was, um, it was longer than the sort of lifetime of the sperm, is what they're saying. So um, all pretty reassuring, uh, smallish sample size, of course, but convincing, statistically significant results. So um, from this, no indication whatsoever to be concerned about male fertility in terms of sperm count and sperm motility. So that one can be uh, left there for now. It's, it's good news. Now, just briefly, a couple of other places today. Um, Mississippi. You might remember we heard from Dave recently in Mississippi. So um, just got the Mississippi government site here. Um, now, this is this is um, this data is from the 7th. No, from the from the 16th. Uh, right. So from, from the 16th. The, <laughs> so the reason I'm getting the reason I get confused is in the UK, of course, we put the date first, then the month, uh, whereas in the US it's the other way around. So anyway, <laughs> I think that's making sense that so this in other words this data is up to the 5th of august so um four days out of date but this is this is live from the website and if we just go maybe full screen on that will that work 
we should be able to see these figures. Now, this is um, really slightly uh, concerning, and I'm, I'm, using, I'm using Mississippi to represent really several other vaccinated states, but in Mississippi particularly. Uh, Hospitalised patients with confirmed infections, 1,242. Um, patients in ICU. Now, this really surprised me that that's that green line there. And there's a very high proportion of patients in ITU compared to the number of patients admitted, which, of course, puts the greatest strain on health capacity. Patients on ventilators, um, 321 in ICU, 170 on ventilators. So we're seeing quite a high proportion there of actually quite poorly patients. And uh, this is putting a strain on the health services. Now, if you go down, if you're interested, um, we can actually go down and, and look at the information from Mississippi. And actually, it tells us that um, there is a bed availability at the moment, but it is starting to be stretched in particular areas. So um, there is cause for concern that as cases carry on increasing due to the Delta variant, this could become a problem. So, and, and even though the, the vaccine rates are being increased in states like Texas, California, Florida, Mississippi, uh, Missouri, I think was another one, Alabama, um, the vaccines are going to take a while to work. Now, another area of concern, uh, Tamlin has written in from New South Wales, which, of course, uh, Sydney area in Australia. Cases continue to increase. Um, so there have been uh, 5,452 locally acquired cases since the 16th of June in this outbreak. It's getting harder to see this getting controlled now in the New South Wales, Greater Sydney area. Currently, 349 COVID cases admitted to hospital with 67 people in intensive care, 29 of whom require ventilation. So again, we're seeing in, in, the, in the New South Wales, Sydney area, 349 people in hospital, but again, a high proportion, 67 uh, in intensive care, 29 being ventilated. Reports of patients being moved to outer Sydney hospitals where there's not as much pressure. So uh, epicentre hospitals are already looking like they're at capacity, patients being moving out. Patients have caught COVID in hospitals and died, apparently, according to, to uh, Tamlin's report. New lockdown of Sydney and New South Wales has had huge is issues with the government being reactive rather than proactive. The whole of New South Wales is not under the same restrictions and local government areas have had different regulations, which has caused a lot of confusion. Places outside of the uh, Greater Sydney are now also coming under the same set of rules. So they are extending the, the restrictions. Uh, New South Wales government continues to be reactive in Tamlin's opinion. So thank you for that report, Tamlin. It, it is concerning. And um, for fi finally, Tamlin comments, I think the days of COVID zero in New South Wales are gone from here on out. And uh, the vaccinations are picking up, but not as quick as we would uh, like. Um, or well, anyone would like, um, and we we would talk to um, to, to Nigel about this in uh, in Western Australia, and he said there wasn't enough slack in the hospital system to deal with a major outbreak, and it's looking like the situation is the same in New South Wales. So, as cases increase there with the Delta variant and vaccination rates remain low, there is I am concerned about really big pressure on the Australian healthcare system this has become a real a real and present danger i'm afraid after so much uh, so much time of good news now the last thing we want to do today uh emma has reported from alberta in canada quite a detailed report it lasts for about 10 or 11 minutes so if you're interested in alberta in canada this is the report for you thank you very much emma and over to you without further ado everyone it's still early morning here in alberta on august 6th and I hope you're all doing well. I wanted to share with you some information on how Alberta, which is in Canada, is approaching managing COVID moving forward. And I think many of you might find it quite interesting. So to begin, Alberta is located in Western Canada and we have a population of just over 4.4 million. Alberta and Canada have largely shared a similar journey to what many other English speaking countries have experienced, being hit with three waves of the pandemic. 
And as you can see, this was experienced across Canada. In Canada, each province has its own independent, broad authority and jurisdiction over healthcare, and each has taken a slightly different approach to COVID. In Alberta, our Premier has advocated for the significant use of personal responsibility to manage the pandemic. As part of this approach, the response has been guided by the assertion that Alberta cannot regulate itself out of the pandemic, there is no intention to get cases to zero, and we must instead learn to live with COVID using public health orders and restrictions sparingly and only when absolutely necessary. Alberta never really had a true lockdown, though our restrictions have waxed and waned over the course of the pandemic. Some of these have included uh, banning indoor social gatherings, a mask mandate, and moving to online learning. While we did have recommendations to stay at home and work from home where possible, we have always been able to move about freely. Alberta and the rest of Canada have been incredibly fortunate to have a robust vaccination program and a very broad vaccine portfolio. Although we got off to a slow start, this is due in large part to sourcing issues, things really ramped up and Alberta was able to set forth a plan for stage reopening tied to a percentage of eligible Albertans being vaccinated and hospitalizations decreasing by certain benchmarks and trending downwards. As part of this graduated process for reopening, the province hit its benchmarks to fully open on Canada Day on July 1st. We essentially lifted all of our restrictions then, though we did retain orders for testing and isolation of cases, long-term and acute care retained some protective measures, and the masking mandate was lifted except for acute and long-term care, public transit, and ride chairs. And actually, several of the provinces made very similar moves at the same time. On July 28th, our Chief Medical Officer of Health announced fairly significant changes on how Alberta would manage the pandemic moving forward by lifting all public health orders by September 1st. So she announced the following changes. Effective July 29th, close contacts of positive cases will no longer be contacted. Close contacts no longer have to isolate and asymptomatic testing is no longer permitted, including that of close contacts. Effective August 16th, positive cases are not required, simply recommended, to quarantine. All isolation hotels and quarantine supports are no longer available. And masking is no longer required on public transportation or ride chairs. Effective August 31st, testing will only be available in GP offices and acute care centers for those patients who are severely ill and the test would alter the direction of patient care. It was announced that this decision was made to be able to shift resources for the fall and winter to cope with the annual seasonal increases of endemic respiratory infections. Instead, the province will monitor wastewater and monitor hospitalizations. When pressed on why this was being put into place, both our Premier and Minister of Health have consistently said that the Cabinet received and approved the recommendations of the Chief Medical Officer of Health on July 8, 2021, without modification, based on modeling and data with a particular focus on the effectiveness of vaccines. There's also a consistent message that vaccines are effective, people need to be vaccinated, and vaccination is the only way out. It's about personal responsibility, not regulating. The message has also been made clear that the decision is made, and it's essentially final. I think it would be fair to say this was rather shocking and unexpected. There has since been heavy speculation over why these orders were issued, but I want to stick to the facts and data, so let's talk vaccinations. I created this chart for comparison's sake using the data from the Canadian COVID-19 vaccine tracker, which sources its data from official government reporting from all of the provinces and the Public Health Agency of Canada. You can see Alberta is a bit behind the rest of Canada, and we actually have the second lowest vaccination rate in the country. And I also want to note that this is the number of people vaccinated, not the number of people who have developed robust protection. As we already know, it takes two to three weeks after both doses to obtain significant protection. Vaccination was prioritized by risk with the most vulnerable and high risk vaccinated in priority sequence. The province had largely vaccinated the elderly with two doses as the pandemic really ramped up this in this third wave. And similar to the UK, the decision was made to vaccinate as many people as possible with a first dose, so the dosing interval was shifted up to four months. 
However, on May 5th, the government announced that every Albertan, 12 years or older, could get vaccinated. And beginning in June, second doses were available with a four-week dosing intervals. With the timing of the changes of dosing intervals, it effectively resulted in the mobile priority groups having 8 to 12 weeks between doses. So most of the high-risk individuals who do have a tendency to be more mobile, as they're not in long-term care, did have about an eight-week delay between doses. This puts Alberta in a situation for our general population that is more akin to the USA and Israel, but the most vulnerable mobile groups is more akin to the UK. As you can see in the graphs, there was a swift uptake of vaccines initially. The top graph shows the number of doses administered each day of each type, dose one or dose two, and the second graph, you see the cumulative coverage of the first and second doses. And you can also see that uptake has essentially plateaued. So going back to justification of data and vaccination efficacy in making these decisions, we've been told that they are based on a presentation from July 8th, and I am not aware of any effort or willingness to revisit and monitor changes, as well as utilize new information to guide decision making and policy. Alberta has seen considerable growth in cases since July 8th. On July 7th, there were 67 new cases with a rolling seven day average of 50. Less than three weeks later, on July 28th, there were 187 new cases with a rolling seven day average of 162. Our R value is above 1.5, which is the highest it has ever been during the pandemic and therefore cases are going to continue to increase exponentially. On July 13th, when testing, tracing, and isolating was still in place, there were 559 active cases in the province. And on August 3rd, just a couple days after close contacts are no longer notified and able to be tested, there were 2,282 active cases in the province. The Delta variant is seeded heavily throughout the country, making up the vast majority of variants present in Canada. As has been previously mentioned on this channel, the CDC in the USA, which is our neighbor to the south, released slash leaked information about the transmissibility of the Delta variant being equivalent to that of chickenpox. They issued a recommendation that all people, regardless of vaccination status, wear a mask in indoor public spaces in areas with high transmission. From their definitions, this is 50 new infections per 100,000 in one week, or an 8% positivity rate. It's also notable, this knowledge became available on July 27th, the day before the changes in Alberta were announced. Effective August 31st, Alberta cannot measure accurate positivity rates as only those with severe disease and where a test result would impact the direction of patient care may be tested in either a GP office or an acute care facility. With these caveats, I actually don't expect much testing to be taking place in GP offices, as if the patient is severely ill, they're most likely already hospitalized and may be in or at least on the cusp of a move to the ICU. The positivity rate, therefore, will be extremely high. So I think in light of this, there may be profound public policy implications. By ceasing all surveillance measures except wastewater, Surges cannot be identified in their infancy, you won't know the magnitude of an outbreak, and we won't have monitoring and screening of variants of concern until a patient reaches severe disease so they can finally be tested. So you can't really adjust capacity until you no longer have time to adjust capacity. It also may very well affect the global course of COVID as the province is potentially primed to brew another new, more deadly, or more transmissible variant, including one that can escape current vaccines. Since we won't have testing samples to screen for variants of concern, we will learn of these when it either affects other jurisdictions or is profoundly increasing in our hospitals. Although Alberta announced this change on July 28th, there's not been very much coverage until about August 4th. It has mainly been doctors and medical professionals speaking out without comment from political leaders across Canada or internationally. On August 5th, the Canadian Minister of Health, Patty Hajdu, wrote to the Alberta Minister of Health stating that she agrees with the Canadian Pediatric Society's assessment that this move is, quote, 
unnecessary and a risky gamble, end quote. Our chief medical officer of health wrote an op-ed defending the move, comparing it to the UK, noting that there is an uptick in the Delta variant before restrictions were listed, but has since done well as a justification. But the UK is continuing to test, trace, and isolate. Really, the UK generally lifted the same restrictions Alberta lifted already on July 1st. I really don't understand the equivalency. Also, if I recall correctly, England delayed their reopening after evaluating relevant facts and data, recognizing that the Delta variant is different, and thusly responded by slightly delaying their reopening so as to get more people vaccinated before restrictions were lifted, and they have not since been reimposed. Fortunately, our local political leaders have been more outspoken. The city councils of the two major metropolitan centers, Edmonton and Calgary, have both called emergency meetings and sessions to discuss the situation and mitigation. The mayor of Calgary was interviewed on August 2nd by CBC News, and I will leave you with an excerpt of his interview on the next slide. Thank you very much. I hope you have found this relevant and interesting, and stay safe. Thank you. Well, thanks for that, Emma. That's a um, very thorough report. Um, I must say I'm a bit surprised. I, I thought things were better organised as this in Canada. Basically, we were not really knowing what cases are happening in Canada. The, the parameter to watch, of course, will be, uh, will be hospitalisations. But good to see that the vaccinations are high. So thanks for that report, Emma. Delta variant causing trouble all over the world. Uh, that, so that was Emma from Alberta. So thank you and of course thank you for watching.